I think you will be very interested in this review. On the workbench today is a Hantac TO1204D, a 4-channel portable digital oscilloscope with built-in DMM and function generator. It has a 7-inch touchscreen and all operations are done via the touchscreen interface, and there are no physical buttons. This scope is provided to me by Banggood, and as usual, I will leave a product link in the video description below for those who are interested in getting one after watching this video. There are quite a few models in Hentax's TO1000 series lineup. It ranges from a 2-channel 110MHz bandwidth oscilloscope-only version, TO1112, to a 4-channel 250MHz bandwidth oscilloscope DMM signal generator combo, TO1254D. And the 4-channel models also have a variant with an auto suffix to the model number. Presumably, they have additional functionality built in to support automobile diagnostics. The version I have here, the TO1204D, has the second highest bandwidth in the TO1000 series lineup, which is 200 MHz. The scope comes in this semi-rigid instrument carrying case with all the accessories that you would expect. The supply charger can output 3 amps, which helps reduce the charging time as the 4-channel scope has a 10 amp hour battery. I think in the manual it mentioned it has four 18650 cells, which we'll verify in our teardown later. By the way, I think I'm going to do the teardown in a separate video later, as we do have a lot to cover in this video. Now, you only get two of these PP200B probes instead of four. In my opinion, they should have provided four sets of these probes, given that this is a four-channel device. But instead, it came with three sets of these BNC to allocator clips. As you can see here, one is probably for the signal generator output. The Mixic STO1004 oscilloscope I reviewed a while ago, for example, is also a four-channel scope, and it came properly equipped with four sets of probes. Maybe the probes are a little bit more expensive than the BNC cables, but given the sticker price of over $450, the extra probes should have been included, in my opinion. Of course, given that the TO1204D has a built-in multimeter, you also get a pair of these DMM leads. There's nothing special about these, though. Size-wise, it's a little bit smaller than the Mixic STO1004 I have here. As you can see, I have the two scopes stacked up. Of course, the Mixic has an 8-inch LCD instead of the 7-inch we have here, and the Mixic also weighs much, much more than the Hantac. Now, the Hantac TO1204D is ever so slightly thicker than the Mixic. Now, you probably will see it's just by maybe a couple of millimeters, but nevertheless, this is not a direct comparison. Just want to give you some reference, size-wise. The case of the TO1204D is made of hard plastic, but we do have these four rather large rubber bumpers, so it should provide sufficient protection when you lock it around. Now, we do also have a stand at the back. You can see we can stand it up like this. Anyway, without further ado, let's power it on. It does take a few seconds to boot up. Oh my goodness, the music is a little bit too much. The boot time though is relatively fast. It was just around 10 seconds, I think. The relatively quick boot up time is certainly a welcome feature, as at least for me, it is directly correlated to how likely and how often I would use a device. Now, it does not boot into the oscilloscope mode directly, but instead you have to select from the menu here, or you can do from the menu on the side here to get into the oscilloscope mode. In my opinion, it's probably fairly straightforward for Hantac to add a configuration that allows you to boot into the desired instrument of your choice, but that's something minor. Let's actually take a look at the settings first. So I come back home and I can press settings. Let's go under system info. The software version is already the latest you can see here is from April this year. And here is an option we can change the put up sound. So before I forget, let me change it down a little bit. And you see here, you can actually create your own boot up music by uploading a WAV file here. I don't know why anybody would do that, but it would be great if I could just disable the boot up music. Now, I suppose I could just upload a silent WAV file, and I might actually do that a little bit later. And let's see what else. 
you can come here to adjust the brightness of the screen. I think the default is just about right. Of course, given that the screen is glossy, unfortunately, it might be a little bit difficult to capture the video on video camera here. I may actually change the angle a little bit later. You can also perform firmware update via USB. Of course, you will have to connect a USB thumb drive first. Now, the auto lock here is a little bit misleading. What it really means is how long the display would be on when there is no activity. And this should be a great feature for extending battery life. But I find it a little bit annoying. As you can see here, the maximum time interval is only one minute. Of course, you always can do infinite. If there is a five minute option, I would probably use that as default. Similarly, you can set the auto shutdown time when idle. To share saved screenshots or other files with your computer, you can turn on the USB share here. And it will appear on your computer as a removable drive. Now, the TO1000 series also supports Skippy command, and you can use Keysight's I.O. to interact with the device. Here you can see the Keysight connection expert recognize the Hantac 1204D I plugged in, and I can issue Skippy command interactively. This is useful if you are using the scope to perform some automated testing. Hantech also provides a Windows application for you to operate the scope, so you can operate the scope from your computer. Unfortunately, I couldn't get my Windows PC to recognize the connected scope. Now, this might just be my Windows 10 machine, not necessarily a Hantech issue, as I mainly use my Windows machine for product reviews, and over the years, I have installed a ton of software and some of them could be incompatible with one another. Anyway, the PC software is probably not all that useful, as it's fairly bearable from the screenshot you can see here. We also have a file browser you can see here. Now, all the screenshots saved would be appearing here. Now, of course, you can also go back here and use the pictures to view the screenshots you have taken prior. Now, let's take a look at the oscilloscope first. I have also turned down the background light and also changed the viewing angle a little bit so you can see the screen better. Now, unfortunately, these reflective screens are very difficult to shoot videos with, and I think this is the best I can get. The ADC used in this scope is 8-bit, which is pretty typical for a portable oscilloscope. I have a couple of signals coming in from my DGE 2070 so that we can get an idea of the basic operations of the scope. I have to say, the UI is very intuitive. In fact, I didn't even need to refer to the manual at all. To enable a channel, all you do is just press on the channel itself, and you can press it again to disable it. But if you press it, it will enable the channel. And here you can see we have the probe attenuation, and you can change it based on the probes you plugged in. We also have the channel bandwidth. You can set the limit on or limit off. And of course, you can always switch the display unit from volts to amps. And this is useful if you have a current probe plugged into one of the input channels. The touch screen supports gestures just like on a tablet computer, which is very easy to use. Let me show you here. For example, if I want to decrease the time base, I just pinch it. And you can see here, no problem at all. And I restore it to the default here. And similarly, if I want to increase the vertical, I just uh, do this here, and you can see that the vertical changes. Of course, you can always use the button on the side if you find it easier to reduce the verticals. And you can also use the button at the bottom to change your time base here. Now, for some reason, the gesture doesn't work on the input channel section here, so you have to use the next button to get to the different channels that you want to use. Just something they can probably improve on. Not a big deal, and you can get used to it very easily. Also, the auto acquisition is very fast. Let me show you here. So let me just change the settings here so that we mess it up. Now let's press auto. And you can see that it acquired a signal relatively quickly. And the beauty of this touch screen is everything is at your fingertip. We can add measurement, for example, and let's uh, do channel one frequency and channel two frequency. Let's take a look here. And you can see here, we can see that channel one is 100 kilohertz and channel two is 200 kilohertz. 
And also we can enable cursor management. Let's take a look here. So for the cursor, we can easily drag it and you can see that how easy it is to measure using cursor function. Now, one issue with the cursors is that you cannot have both the horizontal cursors and the vertical cursors on at the same time. Right now, for example, I have the vertical cursors on. If I try to enable the horizontal cursor, you can see that the vertical cursor went away. I think this got to be a design oversight. Handtech, if you are watching this video, please update the software so that both vertical and horizontal cursors can be used together, as that would be a very common usage scenario. Now let's take a look at an amplitude modulated signal. And currently I'm inputting a one megahertz carrier frequency with a one kilohertz modulation on top. And the modulation depth is 100%. So let's try to auto acquire the signal first. And of course, this is an AM signal. So let's increase the time base here. And now you get a rough idea of the modulated signal here. Of course, let's also check the trigger setup so we can make the capture waveform stable here. So this is a trigger menu. And you can see we have this hold off. So let's increase the hold off here. And as you can see, we adjusted the trigger a little bit and the waveform is a lot more stable than before. Of course, I can still keep adjusting to make it perfectly stable. Now, you can come back here and see that we have a lot of options for the trigger. Here you have the edge triggering and you have the pulse triggering, you can select different pulses and pulse width, and you can even trigger on video signal and slope and trigger timeout, so on and so forth. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but definitely it supports pretty much all the trigger options you need in practice. And what you're looking at here is a frequency modulated signal. The carry frequency is again at one megahertz. The modulation frequency is at one kilohertz with a frequency deviation of 100 kilohertz. And you can see that the update rate is actually very fast. And here we trigger nicely on a arbitrary waveform. This is a hard signal. The TO1204D also has some pretty extensive FFT capabilities here, and you can get to them via the mathematics channel. So for example, if I go to next, and you will see here we have a math channel here. So I can enable that and the source is channel one. And of course you can do mathematics between different channels. But here we're just gonna take a look at the FFT. And I select the center frequency, let's see one megahertz, that's good, as the square wave signal is a one megahertz signal. And we have some ability to choose the frequency span. Let's see uh, 25 megahertz, that will be too high. So let's do five megahertz and let's try the setting. As you can see here, we can actually see the different peaks of the harmonics. Let's actually adjust the horizontal a little bit. Let's change it to say 2.5 megahertz, so we can see a little bit more details here. And let's enable the cursor to see if we can do some measurement here. So let's say we we'll want to measure this peak. And also we want to measure this peak. From the measurement, you can see that the distance between the two peaks are roughly at two megahertz, which is accurate as we have a one megahertz square wave signal. And next, let me demonstrate the single shot capability of this TD1204D. So for that, I have hooked up a power supply and I'm going to measure the power on characteristics. So let's first switch it to the single shot mode. So for that, I come here and you can see right now we're at auto so I can change it to normal and single. Now you can immediately see the status of the trigger had changed to weight. So let's come back here. Now, interestingly, it does not erase the trace. And for almost all the other scopes, the trace in the single shot while it's waiting is actually removed. So this is probably just an oversight, but can definitely be fixed in software. Anyway, let me do the power on and we'll observe the waveform here. And you can see we capture the power on waveform with no problem. And by the way, the storage depth of the scope is fairly good. It is eight mega points for a single channel, four mega points for a dual channel, and two mega points if you enable three or four channels. And you can adjust that by coming into the utility menu here, and you can see acquire, and we can change the memory depth. So for example, you can cycle it through. Right now we are at 4K by default. 
and of course as a multi-channel scope we can also use two channels to display the leafage rule figure and you can see here while i'm varying the frequency input from one channel you can see we're displaying the figure with no problem the update rate is sufficient not as fast as some of the other scopes but nevertheless it's definitely not slow either and here's the lizard rule figure when channel 1 is inputting 50 kilohertz and channel 2 is 80 kilohertz now let's verify the bandwidth claim humming in the background is my hp 8642b signal generator and i'm going to use that to get a rough estimate of the bandwidth here but before i do that let me clarify a few things as almost every time i do this there are quite a few heated comments in the comment section below first is how accurate is the bandwidth measurement using a rf generator like what i usually do well the answer is somewhat complicated you see for analog scopes using a rf generator with a 50 ohm terminated input is pretty much the standard way to measure the scope's bandwidth but it does not always work with the digital scope as we have seen in my other testing videos before that many scopes have some kind of built-in gain adjustment mechanism with either PGAs or software and this is used to compensate the amplifier gain at higher frequencies so without knowing the algorithm used we cannot use the 3 dB bandwidth to reliably determine the front-end bandwidth but the method we use can still give you a sense of at what frequency the scope will no longer be able to measure the input signal due to inadequate sampling rate so at the very least you can verify the claimed sampling speed in my opinion though using an avalanche pulse generator to measure the rise time is probably a better approach to determine the analog bandwidth of the scope which we'll take a look a little bit later so right now i'm outputting a 50 MHz signal as you can see from the rf generator and the output is at zero dbm so there's some cable loss and you can see through this 50 ohm termination we measured about 630 millivolts at a oscilloscope band and let me increase the frequency to 100 MHz first and you can see we're still at 650 millivolts and no problem at all and of course this is a 200 MHz oscilloscope so we wouldn't expect that there's any major change in amplitude and we certainly didn't see that so let me keep increasing the output frequency so let me just go directly to 200 MHz And you can see at 200 MHz, we're getting a pretty stable signal. The amplitude did increase a little bit. That's what I mentioned earlier. So we don't know if there's any compensation inside to compensate the signal. But nevertheless, we can see the waveform right now is at 750 millivolts. And you can see that the signal is a little bit wobbly. And that is probably due to the clock jitter and the sampling circuitry. But nevertheless, it's able to capture the signal at this frequency. So let's increase the frequency a little bit more to 250 megahertz. And remember, this is above our spec 200 megahertz bandwidth. So we can see at 250 megahertz, we're still able to maintain that 680 millivolts. So the front end probably has sufficient bandwidth. And let's increase it to 300 megahertz. And you can see we're able to measure that 300 megahertz with the frequency counter here with no problem and we did see a little bit of drop in amplitude so let's keep increasing to 350 megahertz of course at 350 megahertz you can see the amplitude already dropped below the 3 db bandwidth and that's to be expected but nevertheless, we're still able to measure that frequency through the frequency counter here. Let's actually increase a little bit more to see if we can measure 400 megahertz. At 400 megahertz, you can see the signal is greatly attenuated, but we still are able to measure that frequency. Well, sort of. And by the way, I forgot to mention, the maximum vertical sensitivity is 2 millivolts per division on this TD1204D and the lowest horizontal time base is at 2 nanoseconds per division the maximum sampling rate is specified at 1 giga samples per second and that's for single channel operation 
For dual channel, the sampling rate drops to 500 mega samples per second. And if you enable three or more channels, the sampling rate further drops to 250 mega samples per second. So the maximum bandwidth is actually mostly specified for single channel operation. The maximum specified bandwidth probably will work for dual channel, but just barely. As at 500 mega samples per second, you only get slightly above that Nyquist frequency. And at 250 mega samples per second, you are definitely not going to get your 200 MHz bandwidth. And realistically, you probably are limited to just above 100 MHz. So let's take a look right now. Now let's enable channel two. And bingo, you can see here, we are no longer able to measure that 400 MHz and it's only 100 because of the aliasing. So let's actually reduce the frequency. And let's first reduce it to 250. You can see that's just at the Nyquist frequency. Of course, we're not able to measure that frequency reliably, but if I drop it to 200, I would expect we are able to measure that 200 MHz with no problem. So this is for dual channel operation. Now let me enable another channel here. And again, you can see the same problem here. If we enable channel three, again, we're not able to measure that 200 megahertz signal because right now the sampling rate is only at 250 mega samples per second. So let me further reduce the frequency here. So I would expect we should be able to pick it up at around 125 megahertz. And you can see indeed we're able to pick it up, but again, this is right at the Nyquist frequency. So the measurement is not very stable. And let's reduce it to 110 megahertz. And further reduce it to 100. So if you're using three or four channels, the maximum frequency of the waveform you can observe is probably right around 100 megahertz, as you can see here. And just something to keep in mind. And here I'm using an avalanche pulse generator to generate a very short and fast rising pulse. And you can see the measured rise time is right around 1.7, 1.8 nanoseconds. Like I mentioned before, in my opinion, the best way to measure the analog bandwidth of an oscilloscope is through the use of an avalanche pulse generator. And here you can see the measured rise time is right around 1.7 nanoseconds. And that actually translates to just above 200 megahertz of bandwidth, which means that the claimed bandwidth is accurate. So from what I have demonstrated, you can see that the Hantac TD1204D is a pretty capable scope. Now, it is a pity that the scope does not provide protocol decoding capability, as it does have the hardware capability and storage depth to be able to do that. I think the software just needs to catch up. Now onto the multimeter mode. It is a little bit disappointing that the built-in multimeter is only a 4,000 counts meter. The DMMs in the O1HDS series are all 20,000 counts ones. That said, the implementation of the meter, especially the user interface, is not bad at all. The data is automatically locked, as you can see here. You also get a chart and show you the trend. And you have the min max display alongside of the main display here. So that's all very good. If you plug in a USB drive, you can actually store the locked data onto the drive as a CSV file. I don't know why though, they wouldn't just store it onto the device itself, as it has around 30 megabytes of data storage space. And the captured screenshots are already saved onto the device itself. So not entirely sure why they chose to implement the storage for the multimeter this way. One issue is that there is no relative mode. So it does limit your ability to measure small resistance and small capacitance. I'm going to walk through a few measurements, probably won't cover all the ranges here. Just wanted to give you an idea. Let's start with the DC voltage range. For that, I'm using my EDC M216A voltage standard. Up there, you can see I have already powered it up for a while and it's right now outputting a one volt signal and we can see we are able to measure that with no problem. So let me just quickly cycle through the voltage range here. So let's go to two volts, three, four, and you can see that's because it's a 4,000 counts meter. Now we dropped one digit here, five, six, and the measurement is relatively quick, seven, eight, 
9, 10, no problem. And this meter also has a dedicated millivolts range, so let's take a look at that. And in the millivolt range, we have a resolution of 0.1 millivolts or 100 microvolts. So let's take a look. 100, 200. The measurement is a little bit off, but that's probably within spec still 300. Of course, it's a 400 one, so we won't be able to measure 400. Oh, we are. Okay, so let's see uh, if we can measure 500. No, it's overloaded. Okay. It looks like the error we have here is close to 1%. Now let's take a look at the ohm measurement range. And you can see the auto ranging is pretty slow. And also there's no rail button. Let's just quickly measure this 100 ohm resistor here. Yeah, you can see it's definitely on the slow side. And by the way, the maximum resistance you can measure in the ohm range is 40 mega ohms. Now let's test out the continuity mode. And you can hear the sound is pretty scratchy, and that's because it's not latched. There's nothing wrong with that. I'd rather be unlatched than a slow responding latched implementation. Now, of course, these are not gold plated. That's why the scratchy sound is even more prominent. But nevertheless, you should be able to measure continuity with no problem. That said, given the overall positioning of this combo device, I was expecting a little bit more. For current measurements, I probably would only use the milliamp range for either DC or AC measurements. The reason is that there's no fuse for the amp ranges. This is rather unfortunate, as it's just asking for trouble. Especially given that this is a combo device, you really don't want a multimeter malfunction to potentially damage the entire device. If you remember, we saw the same issue with the Hantec 2D72 handheld oscilloscope in one of my earlier reviews. I don't know why you would provide a high current measurement range without a fuse. Anyway, let's switch to the milliamp range. And by the way, when you switch ranges, you can see that you are reminded where the leads needs to go. Of course, that's just a visual indication, and it doesn't actually physically detect the placement of the leads. And for the current measurement, I'm putting the Unity UT61E+, Plus and the Hantec TD1204D in series. And currently, I'm outputting a roughly 100 milliamps current from the 6181C current source. And you can see the readings largely agree with each other. Now on to the diode measurement mode. In this mode, unfortunately, the output voltage is only at 1 volt. So we can only measure standard silicon diode or shocky diode, and that's pretty much it. You can't use this range to measure LEDs. So let's take a look at the standard diode here. And no issues. The capacitance measurement mode is pretty pathetic. The lowest range is 40 nanofarads, and it has a resolution of just 10 picofarads. And the maximum range you can measure is only 100 microfarads, which unfortunately limits the usefulness of this range. And the measurement is pretty slow too, let me show you that. And here I have a 22 microfarads capacitor, and let's take a look. And you can see that it does take a few seconds for the reading to stabilize. All right, now let's move on to the arbitrary waveform generator function. And for that, actually, I can use the same scope to measure its own output, but I thought it would be easier to use another scope to monitor the waveform here. The specifications are pretty decent. It has a maximum sampling rate of 200 max samples per second and has a 12-bit vertical resolution. And for sine waves, the maximum output frequency is 25 MHz, and for square wave and arbitrary waveforms, it is 10 MHz. It also supports modulation as well, which is a huge plus. So let me show you here. And right now we're outputting a 1 MHz sinusoidal, and you can see that on the Dream Source Lab oscilloscope. So let's actually enable the modulation, so you can see that. So we're currently, the modulation type is AM, and we're modulating with a 1 kHz modulation here. So let's actually increase the time base so we can see the modulated waveform. And you can see, here is our amplitude modulated waveform. And here we're looking at a frequency modulated signal. Of course, we can output a square wave, we can output ramp signal, 
and noise signal. And also we can even output DC signal. And you can use this as a pretty rudimentary voltage source. You can also design your own arbitrary waveforms on the computer and upload onto the device. Each arbitrary waveform can have up to 4,000 points, which is plenty. And here I have one, which I just designed and uploaded to the device here. So you can see that's the arbitrary waveform. And that's pretty much all I wanted to cover in this review video. And we'll do a teardown in the next video. Overall, the Hentac TO1204D is very capable, especially for the oscilloscope and arbitrary waveform generator. As I mentioned earlier, it would be nice if the oscilloscope supports protocol decoding, and it would be icing on the cake if it supports intensity grading. But even without these features, the oscilloscope implementation is already pretty decent, and it's certainly very easy to use. The built-in arbitrary waveform generator also takes competition up a notch, as it includes modulation capability, which is typically only found in dedicated signal generators. The DMM implementation has quite a bit to be desired, but you can scrape by if you don't have any other meters around. All right, I hope you enjoyed this review. If you liked the video, please don't forget to give it a big thumbs up, and remember to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. I will catch up next time.